So good morning, everyone. Today, I will be sharing with you my paper entitled Building Lives Post-Disaster Identity Formation Among Savior Ecoville Settlers. This will actually explore how aid has an impact in the formation of a post-disaster identity. It will focus on the interconnectedness of the person to the home and how this connection is being affected by the interplay of power between the aid providers implementing the resettlement program and the affected community. And this will be guided by the following questions. Uh, what processes did the Savior Ecoville settlers go through to negotiate their identities before, during, and after Typhoon Sendong? What factors influenced whether it contributed or limited the way they utilized their living spaces as they underwent the process of negotiating their identity? What are the perceptions of settlers about themselves before, during, and after Typhoon Sendong? And how are these perceptions affected by the aid provider's perceptions about themselves? And how are these post-disaster identities manifested in the way they utilize or are utilizing their living spaces? And lastly, do the survivors perceive their lives as truly fully settled in most aspects? Or are they uh, really settled in the economic, political, social, spiritual, and emotional sense? Or are they just physically resettled in the resettlement area? So it's also in, um, important to note that negotiation in itself is a uh, very broad. Thus, my study will focus on the negotiation process that is manifested by the way Xavier Ecoville housing beneficiaries utilizes the spaces of their homes. Now, why space and homes? So according to Gupta and Ferguson, space is a neutral grid on which cultural differences, historical memory, and societal organizations are inscribed. According to Eastope, it reflects our socioeconomic system, our values and beliefs. And according to Sherry Ortner, culture is also embodied in public symbols, where worldview, values, and ethos is communicated to others, the future generations, and to anthropologists. Now, in regards to the home, Eastope again said that a home is a place that holds considerable social, psychological, and emotional meanings for individuals and or groups. According to Karsten, it is encapsulating lives. And according to Miller, it is not a mere representation or a semiotic sign of a person, but instead, it is an important part that constitutes our being. So now, let us try to look at the participants of the study. So majority of them were migrants from different parts of Bohol, Surigao, Misamis Oriental, and only one came from the outskirts of Cagayan de Oro City. So they decided to stay because of the work and business opportunities that the city has to offer. And due to the high cost of rent, the piso piso housing program of the previous mayor, Vicente Emano, gave them opportunity to acquire lots for one peso or technically for free. They would actually share that they were already satisfied with um, their location. They already built their lives, their family, and their community at Zone 7, and they were satisfied with their lives in there. Until um, Typhoon Sendong happened, which forced them to resettle. So according to Oliver Smith, to be resettled is one of the most acute expressions of powerlessness because it constitutes a loss of control over one's physical space. So these were actual photos of the recipient while they were being um, transferred from the uh, relocation or evacuation area in West City Central School to Barangay uh, Lumbia. Now, let us go and look at the space. So first, uh, going back to December 15, 2017, uh, in the map here in the lower right portion, this was the track of Typhoon um, Sendong, or internationally named as um, Tropical Storm Washi. So as you can see, Cagayan de Oro was um, on the path of the typhoon. And then on the upper um, 
left hand portion of the map is a flood risk index map of Barangay Carmen. This was courtesy of engineer Dexter Law of um, Xavier University. So as you can see here, um, this is the Cagayan de Oro River and encircled is zone seven, which is actually part of the areas which has uh, the possibility of um, high risk flooding. And then in terms of resettlement, this is um, the city center of Cagayan de Oro. And this is zone seven, Barangay Carmen. So the settlers were resettled 12.7 kilometers to here, Tavier Ecoville, Barangay Lumbia, which is actually about 18 kilometers from the city center. This is Acacia Street of Barangay Carmen one of the major roads that connects um, Zone 7. And this is um, the situation immediately after uh, Typhoon Sendo. This is Zone 7 Barangay Carmen when I visited the area way back in 2017 and 2018. So there are still people living in the area. However, um, some of those are new occupants who occupied the uh, properties or created new houses for uh, on the vacant areas and those there are also those who decided to go back and did, they did not agree to be um, resettled in another area however um, currently the city is actually implementing the no build zone prior to the COVID pandemic. And so they will actually be forced to be um, resettled sooner or later. This is actually the new dike at Barangay Carmen. If you can see here in the photo on the upper right-hand portion, this is the original um, height of the dike. And so this um, new dike is actually about almost three times the height of the old dike, which is this one. And I would also like to pay special tribute to this mango tree because this mango tree, which still um, exists in Zone 7, has saved 12 families, including the entire family of one of the participants during Typhoon Sendo. So let's also look at um, Xavier Ecoville and the aid provider. So the, the um, project of Xavier Ecoville is a resettlement led by um, Xavier University, Ateneo de Cagayan, located at Zone 3, Barangay Lumbia of Cagayan de Oro City. It is a university-donated property comprising a lot area of 5.3 hectares and a total of 517 households with 2,586 individuals. It is also interesting to note that um, this is the only university-led resettlement project in the whole world. But we come to think of it, why Xavier University or why the Jesuits? An article uh, written by a local of the city manifests the influence of the Jesuits in the locality. So Tony Lavinia, in his article written in Rappler on August 2, 2017, entitled Remembering the Jesuits of Cagayan de Oro, said, that someone once said that there are three bosses in Cagayan de Oro. The mayor, usually an alumnus of XU. The bishop. The first one, William Hayes, was a Jesuit. The current one, Bishop Ledesma, is again a Jesuit. And the XU president, the current one is Father Bobby Yup, who will object to and find this characterization strange. But true or not, Cagayan de Oro would not be what it is today without the many Jesuits of Xavier University who have served our city. Although currently the, the bishop as well as the president of um, Xavier University has already changed, but I think this um, characterization still applies to the existing status quo of Cagayan de Oro City. Let's look at the program. Uh, when I asked the participants as to what is the memorable um, process of the resettlement, 
program, all of them would actually um, point to the values formation um, program. This is actually a 10 week uh, values formation training, which um, discusses the 10 core values weekly and teaches them into learning about God, about themselves and about their community. And most of them are very proud about this because among the 24 resettlement sites during the um, typhoon, only Xavier University has offered this uh, kind of intensive values formation program. And to note, you cannot acquire a house if you are not able to complete the said um, program. So further, let's look at the um, site plans of the temporary and permanent um, housing of Xavier Echoville. So this area here are the temporary, this one are the temporary sites. So these are what they call as the bunk houses, which the participants are also very proud of because they would say that among the um, resettlement projects, they were the only ones who did not live on a tent or a an amakan house, a, a, like a sort of a makeshift house. They actually live um, in a house with walls and um, solid roof. So this is how it looks, the um, temporary shelter. And then this area here, with the diamonds are the um, uh, permanent site plans, which um, if we enlarge it, this is this one. And this is the uh, picture of the um, permanent um, housings. So if we look uh, further into the houses or the homes that were awarded to each family, um, this um, photos here were part of the welcome packet that were given to them during the awarding of their homes. And if you can see here, um, they were only allowed to do very minor um, modifications or improvements. So to the, in the front area, they're only allowed to do um, non-permanent um, modifications such as landscaping or anything that for the purpose of um, aesthetics while for the back portion of the house they can create a mid-height um, fence and then they can also add um, extension or extended um, roof here so that um, the rain and the sunlight will not enter the um, area. So these are really the allowed um, improvements or infrastructure improvements to the property. Now, what is the um, problem with these? According to Bordeaux, appropriated structures in physical space is an implied directive of a hierarchy in a social system where power is asserted and wielded. So this comes as a problem or a problematic right now because we we have here settlers who, who felt powerless because of the trauma and the disaster that they have undergone. And then here comes the aid provider here who is waving their flag that, hey, the power is with us. So how did the settlers adapt and negotiated power to form a post-disaster identity as shown by modifications of their homes? Now, on the next slides, uh, you will see the various modifications that um, my uh, the participants of this um, research did, did to their home. So as you can see here, this is the back portion of um, their houses. So uh, it, they actually, instead of a mid-height or mid-sized fence, they actually created an entire wall and literally a house extension. Not just the participant, but all of the houses in this um, block. So these um, extensions 
were actually um, created as um, extended kitchens. So just like these ones, these were the actual kitchens of um, some of the participants. Now, there are also major and permanent um, modifications to the front of their houses, such as these ones. Um, as you can see here, uh, the photo to the left actually even created a semi second floor or roof deck over the um, entire um, structure of the um, house. And then the, the second one here to the right actually created a full wall making the um, front open area of the house as another um, room or the living room of um, their house. So there are other types of um, modification that um, includes utilizing the space for economic purposes such as these. So one here on the upper left hand portion is a store in the front of the property which is actually made of concrete so it's permanent structure and then this one also is a pig pen which is also made of permanent structure we do have here to the right um at the back of the fence actually is the uh the barbecue stall and this area here they made it as a preparation area for what they will be selling which are barbecues there are also um, interior uh, modifications. So these are actually uh, actual photos of the interior modifications done by the participants. So this one here in the lower right is the loft, which became a two bed uh, room. And then this one is the living room. And then this one also is another um, living room. So to summarize, these modifications are not just um, structural in nature, but it demonstrates that the settlers were emotionally, socially, economically, politically, and spiritually settled in their new homes. And in fact, there were also other efforts to adopt, such as two of my participants who were not Catholics, and they continued to attend church service at Zone 7 every Sunday together with other survivors from different relocation areas who were formerly part of their church, which is the Sachs BC or the Zone 7 Akasha Southern Baptist um, Church. So the church also assisted by giving a small amount for fare and they also have fellowship lunches so that the attendees will no longer worry about food after the service. These housing modifications and adaptation efforts only show that the survivors are getting their lives back from being powerless after the disaster. So in terms of power negotiation, the fact that the different types of modification done by the settlers were not destroyed only suggests that there is a constant negotiation with the different power relations in the resettlement area. In this case, the settlers were able to open more possibilities of adaptation as opposed to the limits set by the implementing organization. This process of negotiation not only affects the identity of the recipients, but also the way the programs are being implemented. These housing modifications are expressions of the survivor's identity and a form of assertion that the resettlement program implementers respected. Now to close, I would like to cite Margaret Mead when she once said that the first sign of civilization in an ancient culture was a femur that had been broken and then healed. It shows that someone tended the person through recovery. Our society may have gotten this far. However, healing still involves a community. And this is true even in overcoming the trauma of a typhoon and resettlement. Hence, aid providers can become a source of empowerment to those who are in need. And with this, thank you very much and have a great day.